All right. Good morning, everyone. So I have a I'm the host of this session. So I'll just be going over something real quick before we get into the presentation. Um, the session will be recorded, so just be aware of that. And we'll let's go ahead and get started. So Aloha and welcome to I Teach 808, Empowering Hawaii's Teachers in Technology Conference, sponsored by the Augustine Educational Foundation and Sacred Hearts Academy Honolulu. My name is Courtney, and I'll be facilitating this, converse, uh, this session. We're so honored to have Tazana Saldania join us today and share her expertise through a 45-minute presentation named Cognitive Psychology and Artificial Intelligence. Uh, please be aware that the, we'll be recording this session. If you do not like being recorded, you may want to consider turning off your camera during the session or reviewing the recording afterwards. The recording will be made available on YouTube and shared on iTeach 808's website a week after this event. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Susanna. Thank you very much. Hi, thanks so much, Courtney. A uh, fun fact, we went to high school together. So, you know, the small island once again. Uh, but hi, everybody. It's great to see you. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, so we are going to get very nerdy today and talk about artificial intelligence and cognitive science. Uh, just for the record, this, this whole presentation may have typos. So if it does, uh, just go with it. We're just going to accept that. It's 2022 and none of us know how to spell anymore. Uh, so today we're going to go over the idea that AI is important in every conversation. Uh, our goal, if you leave with anything today, should be that no matter the subject you teach, you should be involving artificial intelligence in your subjects because it is a part of our everyday life. The reality is that AI is everywhere. It knows everything about us from our favorite color to who is in our family to what time we like to buy things on Amazon. But none of us really know how to explain it clearly and let alone explain that to our students. So during this conversation, do feel free to raise your hand, open your mic and say anything if you have questions, uh, because I know AI is a topic that, again, is everywhere, but we don't really talk about it in everyday life. So again, I hope that you feel empowered from this talk to know that you can use AI no matter what subject you teach, and it's not about coding. We're not gonna talk about coding here. So let's get nerdy together about AI. Uh, so when you're in this presentation, you will see several slides that have the essential question at the top. These are slides where you can take the question and use that in your own classroom. So if you see that, just know that that's something that you can take down and use in your own teaching, again, no matter your subject. So to understand artificial intelligence, we have to understand our own brain because the two are very related. And that's what we're going to start with. So let's go ahead and define the first part of our talk and the first part of the name that I gave it, uh, cognitive psychology. So my background, I was a cognitive psychology uh, research assistant for four years, and currently I am working at Mid-Pacific Institute in Communications, but a lot of my background work was talking about how the brain works and why it's important to understand the brain in different disciplines. So cognitive psychology, is all about how your brain does its job. A cognitive psychologist views that the brain is the most important thing in your body. Uh, it is the special thing, it's always its birthday, and it's always in the spotlight. So for a cognitive psychologist, your brain also is the detective of your body. It is able to know that your outside stimulus is affecting your internal thoughts and perceptions. We know that your brain is always taking in information from the world and perceiving it. We also know that in cognitive psychology, your brain builds your memories from the ability to swallow, from the ability to use your language. The brain is really the foreman of your lived experiences, and it is the structure of your identity. A cognitive psychologist also knows that your brain is unlike other animals. It makes us create paintings. It makes us know that things like literature exists. It also makes things that aren't real like Bitcoin and NFTs. So your brain is capable of doing things from basic sensation and perception like taste. And then it all goes all the way to creating abstract systems unlike any other animal. Cognitive science, which is different from cognitive psychology. Cognitive science is taking all these hats that the brain wears 
and applying it to different subjects. That's why the, there is such a barrier between when people who do AI for a living talk about it, it sounds so hard to get because they're talking about it only from a, a point of view of coding, but that's not really everything that AI is. AI is a study of cognitive science and it is a study of how our brain is replicated in a machine, right? So now we have kind of an understanding of the hats that our brain wears and all the things that our brain does on a daily basis. And now we can kind of talk about what is that relationship between AI and our own brain. So let's go ahead and define AI. There's a lot of definitions, but let's just go into it. Okay, so the main way that you should define AI, if anybody on the street, you know, is just asking you about AI, you know, if because that's how we socialize now, we just talk about AI. Uh, AI is a machine's ability to replicate human or animal intelligence. The human or animal intelligence is a key distinction because there are some AI machines that use animal intelligence and there, there's differences there. Second thing that AI is, it's created by humans using coding. Um, AI is also used in video games, apps, healthcare, security, banking, and more. AI is not self-aware yet, and it probably won't take over the world. Some things you can do for your students is have them identify where AI is in the room, right? And the, the reality is that AI is literally everywhere. It's in the phones, it's in the computers, it's even in our, it's going into like some clocks, it's in our TVs, um, it powers all of these devices. The example I like to give when I'm explaining where is AI to students um, is that AI is like electricity, right? To power our world, we use electricity and it's just everywhere. AI is powering all these apps and all these things that we're using. There's just different versions of it and it's being funneled in different ways. So AI powers TikTok and AI also powers your phone's ability to unlock with your face, right? It's just this, it's like this power, right? That is going through all of these apps to make them work. So that kind of brings us into how is AI made which is a fun one, but AI uses several programming languages to operate. But again, we're not here to really talk about the languages. What makes AI so efficient is a real natural curiosity to think about our own brains and our own ability to use intelligence in the world and replicate it. AI learns with large amounts of data and it is typically designed to aid humans already doing everyday natural tasks. You don't have to be a programmer to work with AI or in a technology industry. And I think that's a key that we're gonna tap into later. And AI is heavily related to human and animal psychology, right? So I know that the first one, again, says that it uses many programming languages, but as you'll see through this talk, many of the applications of artificial intelligence come from people who have just a natural understanding of the brain and are curious about making human life easier or more convenient or even improving ways for access to make more apps equitable. Okay, so all of that is cool, but what does it actually mean, right? So those were, that was like the meat and potatoes of our definitions, right? But what does it actually mean when we are talking to our students, right? How do you get this idea of cognitive psych and science and AI to a kid? And how do you break that down and why should you break it down? So the way that I used to introduce it to kids. So after I started working in a perception lab, I ended up teaching for four years the, the same course in artificial intelligence. And I ended up teaching after school and extracurricular classes at public, private, and charter schools, eventually Mid-Pacific, where I now work. So I have learned that kids don't like talking about science too much because it can be very overwhelming for them. So I've had to create some strategies to make this fundamental part of their life and their future, AI, more convenient and more uh, accessible to them. So one thing that I did not come up with this idea, but it's an excellent, an excellent way to give your students uh, uh, inquiry into this topic. I want you to hear me out. I want you to look at these two pictures, and this is an activity you can do with your students. When you look at these two pictures, what are they both doing? Both of these things are flying, right? The question is, what does it mean to fly? 
when we think about human history, right? This is us adults speaking to adults. When you think about human history, there is one thing humans are really good at. It's being jealous and wanting to do things we can't do, okay? We literally took something that birds do naturally and we're like, yeah, no, that's not fair. We need to do that too. So we made planes, right? And that's kind of the basis of what AI is, right? We were so jealous that other humans could do things. We needed machines to do it, you know? And like, it was, that's what we did. So birds are out here like, wow, these humans are really just monopolizing on all our abilities. Now, what's going to be interesting when you, when you ask your kids, you know, what is flight? They're going to look at you and they're going to be like, I don't know, in the air. And then you could ask them, are birds intelligent? Do you think birds are smart? And I mean, no, most people are going to think birds are not smart, right? But I told you before, animal intelligence is important. Animals have an ability that we don't have, and that's flying, right? So the ability to navigate in the air, the ability to know how to use the wind, that is a form of intelligence that birds have. So the essential question, right, is what is flight here? And what you should ask your students is to dig into the differences between birds and planes. So what I want you guys to do is just observe these two, these two things, the bird and the plane, and do some observational uh, differences. So we'll take like two seconds. And by two seconds, I mean 30 seconds <laughs> to just observe these two items and really try to get into the mind of a child and think what would be the difference between the two of them observationally and then go into how they work. So just take a second to think about that. I think we took two seconds, but this is what this is where the conversation would begin with your students. You're asking them to do naturalistic observation, right? The birds have wings, the planes have wings. The birds don't have engines, the planes do have engines. And you can work with them to break down how would humans use these observations to create planes, right? And then you can take this same conversation, like what is dancing, right? Is this dancing? It technically is, right? But is it the same as human dancing, right? So you're engaging with real epistemological, I never say that word right, but you know what I mean, inquiry about what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be a machine? And really specifically, what does it mean to do different actions? This is a great tangible way to introduce this, this really lofty topic of intelligence and humanity and machines role in it, right? Most kids will see these robots and think, oh, yeah, that's a machine. The next level is getting them to understand that apps that aren't, don't have a face are machines too, and they're replicating our abilities. So AI is in all of these things and more, right? And these are things that kids interact with pretty much every day. And we do too. You know, Target, I love using Target as an example. Um, because the reason why Target is lasting as a big box store is their use of AI. Uh, Target apps know how you shop. They know when you shop. They know what to recommend you. All of that is artificial intelligence. That's why it's able to compete with Amazon. They also make it cute, right, by making it feel like it's for you, making it feel personalized, having products that really speak to their demographic. But they know all of that through AI. PlayStation, the Switch, and other video games all use AI to understand not only how the games themselves are working, but what your students and what people's preferences are when they play. So that kind of brings us into our, our next essential question. How do you know what you know? I love this one because it's so difficult. I have given versions of this talk you know, for several years now, and this is the question that always confuses every age group. How do you know what you know? I want you to think just for, again, two, two seconds. How do you know your name? The first thing that should be coming to your mind is, you know, how do I know my name? Well, I hear it. I've seen it written down. All of those first instincts we have when we're asked this question deal with our senses. And if you remember when I was talking about cognitive psychology, cognitive psychologists view the brain right, as the way that we build the structure of our identity. 
So all of those stimuli that we get from the outside world inform who we are. That is kind of how we know what we know. And that's how a cognitive psychologist answers it. But how does a machine know what it knows, right? How do we get machines to know what our shopping preferences are? One other question you can bring up with your students, and this is a great activity to do, is think of where AI is in your daily life, not just in the room, right, but in your daily life. How do you think it was inspired by human intelligence? We can take the target example again. As adults, we know that every time we're using the app, we're giving it more information. Just like every time you tell a child their name, you're reinforcing their identity, right? Every time that we use these products, we're giving it how it's powered, which is data, right? And that can bring us into the question of, well, what's the difference between data and intelligence? Are these machines really smart? And that's, that's the kind of gray area that we're in in humanity now, but that's why it's so important for kids to be in these conversations early because these are the conversations that are gonna to have to keep happening as we get older. So this might seem like a tangent, but a good question after the, how do you know what you know is what is intelligence? Or for younger grades, you can ask them, what does it mean to be smart? Most kids, one of the funniest things that a kid has ever told me when I've asked him this question is like knowing when not to disturb mommy. You know, that's what they thought was being smart. And I think that that's just excellent. Nobody wants to be disturbed, they're learning. Uh, so how do you know what it means to be smart? And how do, you, how do you lead a kid in this conversation? The brain wears a lot of hats. And if you're approaching this conversation again, you need to have that, that understanding. The brain is wearing a lot of hats. My dog is barking. You know, the brain is doing a lot of things at one time to try to live through life. As an adult, you can understand that. And that having that knowledge that your brain is the powerhouse of the cell will help you with getting your students to understand this. So your brain is getting all this data from the world through their senses. That's why especially early educators know that so many of our lessons are about the senses, right? Because that's how kids learn best. But as older students um, grow up, high school and even college, they don't use their senses as much, but it's important to ground them in that thought again, that your senses are really impacting everything you're doing, right? So when we're asking how is machine, how are machines learning these things about us? How are machines working? They're using their senses too, right? Spotify, for example, the music app, it's using, uh, it's understanding what you use at your hands to touch with, right? So it's taking the data of what you're touching, right? If my dog could please, yep. <laughs> it's taking the data of what you're touching and then it's taking the sound of the music itself, right? They build algorithms to understand that Paramore is a certain type of genre and Willie Nelson is a certain type of genre. They assign meaning to the sounds as programmers. That's really all they're doing. Now, your interactions with the app, if you really like listening to Paramore, you're going to get more things that are coded to sound like Paramore, right? More things that they've identified. Eventually, over time, the machine learns certain rhythms in the song, certain things, certain lyrics, all this data about a song equals this type of genre. That's how, at the end of the year, Spotify is able to tell you your mood, right? Mine was angsty. You know, no surprise. I'm wearing a flannel in 80 degree weather, right? Like that's that's how we are as individuals. That's how these AI know more about us sometimes than other people because we spend more time giving these apps data about ourselves and maybe interacting. And it's important for students to know that. Let's talk about another example. The phone itself, right? The phone as a piece of hardware. The phone, uh, iPhones in particular, I don't know what you Android people do, but the phones in particular, unlock with your face, right? So now my phone is unlocked. That is artificial intelligence, right? Because the phone is using its eyes, its camera, and its memory of what your face looks like to perform a specific action, right? Remember when phones unlocked with your thumb? Same thing. It's using the memory of that thumbprint to unlock, right? And can we argue that that's an intelligent behavior? Yes, we can. That is intelligent. Now, a good rule of thumb 
And this is where, you know, kids kind of get like cocky with me and they're like, oh, so every machine's intelligent, right? A calculator must be intelligent because it's doing something for you. A calculator is not artificial intelligence because it is not doing an action on its own. You have to tell the calculator what to do, right? You have to do two plus two, and then it will equal four for you. It's not just going to look at you and be like, she wants to know what three times three is today. No, that is artificial intelligence. It's the ability to do something without you actually doing anything. So I hope that makes sense if a kid tries to tell you that a calculator is AI. You can just be like, nope, it's not. <laughs> Okay, so, oh, and then yes, there's my angsty and bold mood from Spotify as proof in case anybody was wondering. Uh, but another essential question, older children will start to ask you this now, is AI smarter than us and why should we care about that? Uh, the real answer is kind of, and yeah, AI is getting to a point where it is getting smarter than us. You know, three years ago when I used to talk about this, I used to say, no, AI is not smarter than us, but it kind of is getting there and it's getting there in very specific ways. You know, the reality is that AI is not going to sit and have a conversation with you tomorrow. It's not going to be at the level of human creativity yet, but can it find cancer faster than humans? It's getting to that point where it can in, in scans, right? AI is getting to a point where it can make predictions about buying purchases better than a, a marketer with 30 years of experience, right? So when I say that AI is smarter than us and for older children to understand this, it is smarter than us in specific tasks, just like how birds are smarter than us in flying. You know, they're better at it than we are, right? So the, the machine is now becoming smarter than us in specific tasks. Now, no talk is complete without resources. So here we are for the resources. Uh, for your, your educational needs, um, here are some different examples of how AI can be, have an essential question in different subjects. So you have now this understanding that the brain is the powerhouse of everything we do. So much of our brain's ability to perceive data informs artificial intelligence. Now that you have that baseline understanding, how do you bring AI into any subject? You can ask questions like these, right? Without being a programmer or a coder. Perfect example for a history teacher. Choose a period of time or a specific historical event and how would it have been different with AI? Just engage them in that kind of conversation and make them think about the present versus the past, right? If you think about the assassination of, of Kennedy, how would that have been different if we had AI in the cameras back then? You know, how would we have, would we have seen it coming? All those kind of things, right? How does AI influence popular music and niche culture through curated playlists? Are we, how, how is that personalization of music affecting music discovery? Is it a good or a bad, right? That's a culture question. Uh, one of my favorite questions on here, oh, I put five twice typos. <laughs> One of my favorite questions is how do characters in video games know how to play with us? We're, we're going to talk about games a little bit more in a second, but kids don't really realize that, that, that what they're playing with, not other players like real humans, but the players that are non-playable, those are AI. So that is something they're doing every day with them. How do the characters know how to play with us? Get them to think about that. Um, and a big one, you know, number five, two, <laughs> is what is privacy? What does it mean to be private? Very different definition from even 10 years ago. And that is something you can explore with them. And there really is no right answer right now. And so it's the perfect kind of essential inquiry question to bring up. So another, another big resource is the thing that owns all of our lives, Google. Um, but Google is free for a reason, right? And this is another thing you can bring up, but Google is free to use because we are paying with our identity. It's kind of just a thing. Same with Facebook, same with TikTok, same with Instagram. Well, Facebook is Instagram, but the reason why these companies are so huge and they keep growing is because we just feed it with our soul. And there's different questions you can go into students about that with, right? But every time we use these apps, we're telling it more about ourselves. That's how they make money through ads. Um, but Google 
still is a good resource for how AI works because they have so much data. So it's like a double-edged sword, right? And they make their experiments free, which is good. So AI experiments, um, if you just search Google AI experiments, it's free kid-friendly activities that you use AI in different ways. Um, you also, and I'm gonna give you QR codes for this stuff in a second. So don't feel like you have to write all of it down. Um, Google Books Ngram Viewer. I'm also an English major because I'm crazy, but what, one of my English projects in school was I searched the word feminism and I saw how often was it used through time, right? So that's what Google's Ngram view does is you put in a word and it shows you a graph of how that we, word was used in books over time. So you see peaks, you know, obviously in the 60s when there was that wave, you see it in the 20s, you see it a lot now. So it's very interesting to see how culture has affected words. That's a form of AI. Google AI Kits is an investment. So that one is not free, but you can see the instructions online. Google AI Kits are little cardboard kits that have little you know, parts that kids can put together. And then once it's put together, it actually becomes like a Google Vision or a Google speaker. So they create their own like, hey, Google speaker, and it talks with them. So that one I think is $50, but there's also education discounts and you might be able to get your school to pay for it as well. So I told you there were gonna be QR codes. So one of my favorite AI experiments, and this works really well with any age of student is emoji scavenger hunt. There is a QR code there for you to scan if you wanted to. So emoji scavenger hunt is a form of artificial intelligence that, and it's a game that works by using your phone's camera to find emojis in the environment, right? So you can see on the screen that it says find shoe and the guy is pointing the camera at his shoe. So remember we were asking, how do you know what you know? How does the machine know that it's a shoe? It basically has a database of what shoes look like. So a bunch of pictures of shoes and can compare it in real time to your live camera, right? So that is how this one works. And what's great about Emoji Scavenger Hunt and all the AI experiments is they have the definitions of how it works there for you to say. The Ngram viewer, which is like a, a different type of nerdy, which is my favorite one. This is the example of how words are used over time. So you'll see the use of Albert Einstein, Sherlock Holmes and Frankenstein on a linear graph and how they're, they're used over time. So that is, you can play with different words just like normal Google in there. Um, and I've, if you need me to go back to anything later, I can as well. Some, some games, videos, and books that are great resources. Alien Isolation is not for little kids. Just let me, just let me preface by saying that. It is exactly what you think it is. It's that movie Alien, but a video game. So don't show that to little kids. But there's an excellent YouTube channel called AI in Games, where they break down how the characters work with AI. AI, Alien Isolation is one of the, the best video games uh, using AI. And the reason why it's heralded as one of the best is because it's so hard to beat and the alien in the game is so intelligent and knows like where you're hiding. It follows you. It, know, it learns if you're a passive player or an aggressive player and it matches. So very complex enemy system in that game and really interesting for older kids who are wanting to see how that works in games. Pac-Man is good for the little ones because everybody loves Pac-Man. And Pac-Man, all the little ghosts in the game trying to get you are the, are the AI. So you can talk about how each one behaves differently. There's a lot of videos on YouTube talking about AI and Pac-Man because it was one of the first to really use it extensively. So that's a great source. Another one that's really fun and speaks to the English major in me is Guess the Language. If you go to Google and you search Guess the Language, look for like an audio only video, they're going to play all these different types of languages. So like uh, French, then German, then Chinese, and you never see what the person looks like. You just hear the language. And you have to ask your kids, what language is that? And what's interesting is that kids who grew up in Hawaii almost always recognize the difference between the Asian languages. They always know what Chinese is. They always know what Japanese is. They can't recognize German versus French though. And what's cool is what you do is you open Google Translate 
and have Google Translate try to tell you what language that is using the mic. And Google always gets it right. So you have that conversation of why is Google getting it right, but we're not, right? And usually the answer is because we've never experienced it before. We don't have the data of German language in our brains, but Google does. Uh, a fourth book that's really great for people who are interested in AI, but don't want to get bogged down by like coding and, and Python and all that stuff is how to think about machines that think. So it's a book of really just every like quotes about people who think about AI. So you'll get people like me who are just like elementary school teachers or people who teach AI at, on, casually. So you'll get researchers who try to bring it in layman's terms. You'll also get philosophers, artists who use AI. So it's a lot of different perspectives in short bites about how to think about machines that think. Uh, so those are my main resources. And again, we can bring back to the center of this talk, use AI in conversation more frequently and encourage children to be more curious about it because it is everywhere. And it has been for a bit, but it's just going to keep increasing in their lives. And in order to be viable for the job market that's changing, they need to be curious more than anything. And they need to be willing to understand humanity's role in technology. And that really starts from having a deep and, and confident understanding in how their brain works and what their brain is capable of. So I will leave it there for questions from any, any, anybody out there. I can't see the chat though. Oh, there's chat. Hello, sorry, real quick, um, before any questions, I just wanna go over something at the end and then I'll go ahead and leave the room so that you're free to go over anything else. But thank you so much for that presentation. It was really great. Um, let's see. So thank you very much to, Z to Zana and for everyone's participation. We hope that you, you will find this session helpful and make some valuable connections to it. Um, if you have the time, please help us complete the survey on the iTeach808 website. Um, I will link it in the chat after. And then the survey will also be sent to the email that you registered with. Um, you can also check your spam folder for, for any emails from the iTeach808 Hawaii at gmail.com. And then if you do do the survey, um, you will be entered to win one of 20 five dollar gift cards target gift cards if you complete it by february 4th thank you for being here today and feel free to join the other sessions coming up but also there is some time so about 13 minutes or so to go over any questions with tazana if you guys have thank you so much hear that target gift cards perfect <laughs> um did, yeah so any questions i know that uh this is kind of a lot so any, any inquiries about how to use AI in your class, how it works in, in general, your fears about it, any stuff like that. Oh, yes, Catherine, how can I help you? Hi, hello. Um, I was wondering if you have any more examples of like how you apply cognitive psychology specifically, I guess, to AI. And um, I also have kind of like an educational question, more mm -hmm. of like a thought. Could you kind of explain to kids a, like training an AI to learn different things? Like, because AI, like intelligence is basically like recognition first and foremost, and then using that recognition to like generate different outputs based on, you know, what it thinks you might want, what it's learned. Mm -hmm. Could you, would a good analogy for that be like training a dog? Yes. Like a dog like recognizes a word that you say and then knows what to do once you say that word. And also like the way that we've trained dogs to, you know, detect different cancers or diabetes and stuff like that. Like they have different senses than us or they have, you know, dogs maybe are not inherently more intelligent than humans, but they have different strengths just like computers do different mm -hmm. to us. Right. Like, I feel like that would be a good analogy. Is that 
but it was is there like a way that that analogy could not work <laughs> Yeah, that's no, thank you for that. It is a perfect one. I know your question was more examples of how to bridge artificial intelligence and cognitive psych. I do often use the dog one. So the dog one works a lot better in person than virtual because what I'll do is I'll get a kid to come up to the front of the class and I'll tell them to sit, right? And then I'll tell them to stand and then I'll tell them to like chase their tail, right? <laughs> and they know how to do all that stuff. And then I'll be like, okay, when you tell your dog, these things, does it know it? And some people will say, well, I didn't train it how to do X trick, or I, I only, it only knows sit. And then you ask them, well, how does the dog know to sit? And they have to think about, well, yes, I repeat myself what you said, it's repetitive, but the dog doesn't understand what sit means. And that's what we go over in the class. They don't know sitting as a, a thing that you do for leisure right? The way we can think about sitting on the dock of a bay, right? Or sitting under a tree. They just know that the word like sit, that sound is associated with this physical action that I do. And then I get a reward, right? That's Pavlov uh, classical conditioning, right? Uh, so that's how we train dogs. Similarly, you know, machines, when we're teaching them how to do things, they get rewarded not by treats, but saying, you know, this is the correct answer through algorithms, right? Like this equals true or this equals false. So the machine knows to try to get more true statements than false statements. So when the when you're putting your phone to open your face with your face, the phone doesn't know who you are in the sense of I know her, you know, I, I've, I've been with her in, in school since I was in like second grade. The phone just knows that these specific features equal my owner. So I will unlock for it. Does that make sense? You know, it's, it's always just important to preface that knowledge for machines and dogs is at a very performative and actionable level, whereas humans know things deeper and can have more associations with those things, right? Right, I have a follow-up question that might be yeah. more related to programming, but how does a machine know, or how does how is it motivated to wanna to get more true statements than false? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, mostly that starts to get into like coding, right? And, and how to use math to basically equal a reward. But usually you could say something like, if true five times, then, then perform this action. So if you broke up the features of your face, right? The phone knows that I have to get the eyes correct. I have to get the nose correct and I have to get the mouth correct. So that way the machine knows that if all three of these fields that I'm looking for equal yes and, and match the photo in my memory of this face, then it's that person's face. Whereas like if I had like my mom's face who looks just it's similar to me, we have different noses. So the machine will know like, oh, these two are correct, but this one's not. So that doesn't equal true. So I will not unlock. So that's how you teach reward and yes and no to make a machine do something in a very layman's way. That is how it's working. It's just quantitative statements. So it's not necessarily like, it doesn't really fit with the dog metaphor in that sense. Cause it's not like the machine is like, the machine is not motivated by treats. Like it doesn't get a reward. It's just that like, yeah, there are, there are things, conditions that are satisfied. And for a dog, but it still works because the conditions of getting food are satisfied. A machine is just motivated by math because it's a nerd, you know, <laughs> you know, machines are motivated by getting the math, right? Dogs are motivated by getting a physical reward. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's still, I think it still kind of implies that like a machine has, I don't know, because the machine doesn't have motivation. It's just like what we tell it. And then it's like, I don't, yeah, I don't know. You're getting, yeah, it's going to get philosophical, you know, like what, what equals yes. Oh, it's <laughs> extrinsic motivation because we're, yes. we're motivating it. Ah. Yes. I think I saw someone else unmute down here too. Thank you though for that. Oh, hi. I had a kind of a related question, if it's all right, if we have time. Yeah. Um, so we were kind of talking about the philosophical aspects of AI. 
So when we talk about Siri and Alexa and games like Among Us or any games where people, well, I notice people don't always speak kindly to Alexa or Siri, or even in games, they'll do things, you know, they'll take each other out or whatever, especially with the younger ones. So I guess if you're teaching elementary, how do we address, yes, we know it's not a person, but it looks like a person, it's acting like a person or even avatars. How do we approach um, respectfulness, kindness, uh, regard for uh, things that seem human, even though we know they're not, I guess. That's a great question. And I think it piggybacks off of the last one, what Catherine was asking, right? Because when we look at machines, they're not motivated by getting fed, right? They're not real, but they're acting real. So it's hard for us as humans, especially people who are, you know, like our age, like, because we are, we are kind of coming into this technology as adults, but for children, they've had it this whole time. So they don't see the separation the way we do. Right. Or they, they see it and they, they see it in extreme polars. Like that's a machine. I don't need to be nice to it. That's a human. Right. So I, let's just use the dog example. We are nice to animals because we know that they're alive and we feed them and there's laws to protect animals. Right. Like when I was a researcher, we had more rules about testing animals than testing humans. Like we couldn't do certain things, but machines are kind of this weird gray area. And that's why there's so much fan fiction about them and like Terminator, you know, and movies that explore this. It is important to understand that these machines are becoming more and more like us and they are a part of our lives. So we have to respect them uh, as if they were not people, but as if they were any type of service that helps us, right? So when you think about going in a taxi and the person driving you is helping you, you don't just like graffiti their car after. If we get to a point, which we will, where we have cars driving us, you don't disrespect it just because it's not a person in there, right? It's still a thing that's helping you through life. So that is how I would break it down. It's just because it's not living and just because you're not giving it a snack. It is intelligent and it's operating at a way that it's meant to improve your life. So you have to respect it. Just like how you respect your home, you respect other physical objects that you own, right? So in the specific case of Alexa, you know, teaching people, it's, it's almost a great teaching tool because if you, if you hear your kids saying, Alexa, do this, or shut up, Alexa, right? You have to explain to them, like, what if it did have feelings? You know, what if it did have feelings? How would, how would it react to you? It goes to how do you know what you know, right? What if someone spoke to you like that because you're just serving them coffee and it's like, go get me more coffee, right? You have to teach them that these machines are replicating human intelligence and that they are, they do deserve the respect of that because it's a, it's a good algorithm or a good analogy for other workers in life that we might not respect. Does that make sense? Yeah. Great question though, we're getting deep, <laughs> which is what cognitive and AI does. Um, I know we have like a few more minutes. Any other questions? I, people usually ask me if we should fear AI. Any, the AI fears out there. Good, none of us are afraid. I think we're good. Alrighty, I feel like we are good. Um, I will put my email in the chat as I'm supposed to do that, uh, but my email is there. It's the at midpacky.edu email, so it's easy to remember. If you have any questions about AI, want to learn more about how to bring these lessons into any subject, or if you would want some of the resources that I gave, if you didn't have them, um, feel free to reach out to me. And again, I just encourage you to keep being curious and these questions that you feel like are really difficult to answer, that's the meat of where we're going, right? Like how do you treat AI as human if they're not human? That's perfect, right? Is a dog a good analogy? Those are the questions kids should be exploring because they're gonna ultimately define that, that future for the technology for us. But thank you so much for coming. I will see you all, I'll, I won't see you again, but you know, it's good seeing you. <laughs> Have a good rest of your conference. Thank you very much. Thank nice you. seeing you again. <laughs> Have a great day, bye. Thank bye. you.